<laughs> Welcome. My name is Phyllis Thompson. I'm the Director of Women's Studies here at ETSU, and I want to welcome you to the 13th Annual Notable Women of ETSU Colloquium and Award Ceremony this evening. Um, I want to take a moment to welcome, first of all, Dr. Bailey and Dr. Skatsina um, and their families, and we're so glad to have you here, especially all the way from Michigan. <laughs> Quite a drive. Um, I'd also like to welcome special guests, um, other special guests that we have in the room. We have several notable women who are here from earlier years, and we welcome you. Um, also, um, the program coordinator of Women's Studies, Brandy Teeter, is here. The assistant director, and if you'll please stand, Dr. Hillary Malatino. <laughs> and, and also, the women, many members of the Women's Studies Steering Committee is also here. If y'all will also stand, please, and be recognized. It's with, with these people that this evening is made possible. The work of Women's Studies is a collaboration um, between many women on our campus. And without them, this evening would not happen. And without them, the work that we do in our program, both in terms of curriculum and our classes, as, as well as in terms of the activism and programming that we have on campus would not be possible. Um, we also have five special guests this evening who are the brand new inductees of IOTA, 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 which is our um, honor society in women's studies. And I'd like to recognize you. Um, these five women are Sarah Dean, if y'all would stand, Caroline Locke, Misty Scott, Catherine Travis, and Ashley Wiesnick. Women's Studies at ETSU is truly a distinctive program in our interdisciplinary approach to curriculum, in our leadership through diversity, um, emphasis on campus, and also because we are in our position in the state as the only major in the Tennessee Board of Regents system. We're proud of this opportunity that we have to serve the region and the community and our campus, and we're prouder still of our 31 majors and minors who are dedicated to critically engaging issues of gender and sexual equity here in the Appalachian South, but also nationally and globally, and to improving conditions of life for those around them. This evening, though, we're gathered to celebrate and to recognize two women who have dedicated their careers to the kind of education, research, grant winning, and community engagement that changes lives and is the embodiment of what Women's Studies stands for. As is customary on these evenings and these celebrations, what I'll, what I'll do is I'll introduce um, each of our recipients one at a time, and that recipient will give her talk, and then I'll introduce the second recipient, and then, and then that recipient will give her talk, and then we'll open the floor to questions um, at the end of the evening so we all can engage in discussion. So that will be the order of our program. It's an honor to recognize the first of our two notable women recipients, Dr. Beth Bailey. As her nominator wrote, Dr. Beth Bailey, quote, epitomizes the ETSU values of putting people first, striving for excellence, bringing integrity to her relationships, promoting diversity of people and thought, and modeling efficiency of resources and commitment to achievement. Dr. Bailey is a tenured professor with the Quillen College of Medicine and currently serves as director for primary care research for the Department of Family Medicine. Her nomination highlights her exceptional dedication to university and community. She has served as director of research for the Appalachian Center for Translational Research and Health Disparities 
as member of the Prenatal Drug Abuse Task Force for Southwest Virginia and Northeast Tennessee, and since 2008 have served, has served as a member of the advisory board for the State of Tennessee Women's Health Report Card. Dr. Bailey routinely collaborates on projects with other universities such as UCLA, Rutgers, North Dakota, and West Virginia. She was instrumental in acquiring funding from the Tennessee Department of Health for regional Tennessee intervention for pregnant smokers, the Pregnant Smokers Program, or TIPS as it's called, from 2007 to 2012. This program improved birth outcomes in six northeast Tennessee counties with the highest rates of pregnancy smoking by reducing rates of smoking and smoking exposure, providing counseling to over 3,200 pregnant women, training over 280 healthcare professionals, and 1,000 health profession students who went on to provide prenatal care to over 10,000 women. The initial $2 million investment in TIPS led to 9.5 a 9.5 million reduction in newborn hospital costs and untold savings in long-term health and educational expenses. While TIPS has significantly improved the quality of life for an underserved at-risk group of pregnant women and their children in the region, it has also provided undergraduate and graduate students across many disciplines on this campus the opportunity to gain invaluable hands-on research experience. As her nominator wrote, Dr. Bailey is extremely hardworking teacher, mentor, researcher, and advocate for women's health and has impacted the lives of women in Tennessee and across the Appalachian region through her teaching, research, and service. The Women's Studies Program is delighted to honor and recognize Dr. Beth Bailey tonight, Notable Woman 2014. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. There are many more faces than I thought I would see when I looked out this evening, um, and it's great to be here. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Thompson um, and the Women's Studies Program Committee in particular for this nomination um, and those who nominated me from within my department. Um, I am truly humbled. I've, Karen and I have spoken a few times about this, and um, we're having a little bit of trouble with all the attention on ourselves. Um, we, we tend to work more in the background. Um, we tend to um, work for other people, and so it's kind of hard um, to be asked to come up here and talk about ourselves. So um, I'm going to try to do that over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, I was asked when um, I was nominated to um, talk a little bit about my professional and my personal journey. And so I'm going to try to do that this evening. Um, the professional journey is long at this point, and so there's a lot to talk about. But um, I picked a few things that I thought might be of interest to the group here. And of course, Dr. Thompson um, very eloquently summarized my career. And so I want to um, just hit some of the highlights. So um, what I thought I would share with you uh, this evening um, in terms of how I got to where I am is really how the exodus of everything and how I got to be known as the pregnancy smoking lady because that's <laughs> kind of who I am anymore. <laughs> and so um, I have to, everywhere I go, I get these questions about pregnancy smoking. And so um, it's interesting because this isn't where I started when I started my career. So um, I am originally from Michigan and was at Wayne State University for my doctorate degree and I was hired to stay on there for several years. And the people that I worked with there were doing research um, in prenatal substance exposure. And so they were working with women who were using drugs, who were drinking alcohol, who were smoking, and they were looking at the long-term effects of those substances. 
And so I came in as a very new graduate student and uh, was assigned to do some assessments with babies. I was assigned to do data analysis and kind of learned about the field. Well, by the time I had done that for about five years, I was really hooked. It was something I found fascinating. I really enjoyed doing that kind of work. And so for the next five to six years or so at Wayne State, I was working on projects. I was very fortunate to get some NIH funding, some major R01 funding. And so for me, as I was looking um, and trying to make a career choice, a couple years after I had finished graduate school, I was trying to decide what I wanted to do. And I really enjoyed what I was doing at Wayne State, but I had been encouraged by a couple of my mentors there that what I really needed to do was branch out and find my own space. And so um, that was when I accepted the position here in 2003. And I had a really interesting time the first year or so because I came here with this expectation that I would do similar work that I was doing there. And most of the women that we worked with during pregnancy were either drinking alcohol or were using cocaine. Well, I got here in 2003 and I started talking to some of the OB providers and I found out there's not a lot of alcohol and there's not a lot of cocaine used during pregnancy, at least that people were recognizing at the time. So I thought, okay, now what do I do? Because that was really kind of what I had invested a lot of my career in. So um, I started talking and I started reading and I started networking in the community and very quickly realized that the problem during pregnancy, pregnancy here in terms of substances is not alcohol and it's not cocaine, but it's tobacco. And so when we look at pregnancy smoking in this region, um, the rates were very high when I got here, and they actually were going up when I started working in this field. And so I started looking for ways to find money to fund projects. Uh, this was at about the time, if you're familiar with National Institutes of Health Funding, um, that it got very tight, to say the least. And so in the 90s, when I was in grad school and early in my career, you could write a big grant, and you had a decent chance of getting it funded. Um, and so that was the model I was expecting when I got here. And so I started writing these big grants thinking, okay, something will hit, something will hit, and it didn't. And I had talked with one of my previous mentors in Detroit who said, yeah, the funding climate's really changing. You need to kind of find something and make it your own, but you need to do something called translation. And I thought, well, what is that? Um, I had been working for a very long time doing research looking at a woman uses a substance, these are the outcomes. And that had always been enough in terms of what people were doing. And so we were finding the associations between things, but it was other people who were doing the interventions and were doing the work in terms of intervening with these women. And so I very quickly realized that the money was all in translation. So if you wanted to do the research and you wanted to look at what the <coughs> effects were of these exposures, you had to have a solution for the problem, um, which certainly makes sense when you think about it. Uh, but 15 years ago, that was really not the climate. The people who did that basic research were not the people who then went on to do the interventions. And so being a developmental psychologist, I had some background in um, intervention type of models, but had never actually done it in practice. So I was not a clinician. I hadn't done these kind of things. And so I was really looking at how do I kind of morph my career in this direction. So I started looking at ways to find some funding. Um, university was very generous with an RDC grant. I found, got some small pots of money from the March of Dimes. I took advantage of students whenever I could, um, who <laughs> are wonderful labor. <laughs> um, and in particular, I had a couple really good summer medical students who were very gung-ho and would go in and review charts for me so I could look at relationships, would go out in the community and help me network. And so um, it, it tended to be a, a very good way to collect some data. So I kept writing grants thinking, all right, eventually something will, will work and I you know tried to be optimistic and I started publishing so I had these small sets of data that were interesting I was finding some very interesting things in the relationship between pregnancy smoking and birth outcomes especially in this region where there hadn't been a lot of research on that um, and so I was very fortunate I was invited to present several places at national meetings um, at state conferences and got some recognition for what I was doing and I had at this point maybe half a dozen publications in this field so I was in the middle in 2006 of writing a grant trying to look at pregnancy smoking and birth outcomes and long-term child development outcomes when I got a phone call. And it's really interesting when you look at careers and kind of things that change a career path. And this one phone call that came in December of 2006 really changed the direction of my career. Um, I was, as I said, I was working on this grant and I get this call from somebody in the governor's office in Tennessee. 
And uh, the gentleman said to me that he was the newly appointed um, director of children's care coordination. It was a new office set up by Governor Bredesen to look at how we could deal with infant mortality and morbidity across the region. And in particular, they were looking at putting a significant amount of money into East Tennessee. Well, they had done their research and had looked and decided that smoking during pregnancy was one way they could get the most bang for their buck in terms of a problem to address to see some very immediate improvement in outcomes. So um, I was asked a question that anybody who's been doing research for a while would love to be asked, and the question was, if you had a lot of money, what would you do? So, well, <laughs> let me tell you what I think you should do about the smoke, pregnancy smoking problem in Tennessee. And so we said, okay, great, you know, we had a good phone conversation, maybe 20 minutes, and he said, could you write that up for me? Okay, sure. Um, you know, you always love to be asked if you can uh, supply information related to policy. And I said, sure, I'll write that up. So I kind of viewed it as a grant application and wrote it up and sent them a draft. I said, this is what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, could you include a budget? I said, well, how much money are we talking about here? You know, that's where we usually start. Are we talking about 150000 a 100000 He said, think more like a million. All right, I can think big for a million when we think about intervention. And so I drafted this up, and this was this was in the middle of December, and he said they needed it before the holidays. So December 23rd, I finished this up, sent it out, thinking, okay, maybe this will go somewhere, maybe it won't. Um, you know, but at least I was able to have input in terms of how policy was going to go. Um, got back into the office on January 2nd, and there was a message waiting for me, um, wanting to know if I could come and talk to the people in Nashville about what I had proposed. I thought, sure, great, I can come and talk for an hour about what I think the state should do about the pregnancy smoking issue. So um, I went to Nashville within the next few days and met with people, and, and I was pleasantly surprised. There were a lot of people from the health department, there were people from Vanderbilt, from some of the universities across the state that were part of the steering committee, and they really knew, seemed to know, they clearly had read what I had written, had done some research, and said this is a significant problem that we need to do something about. And so I was very encouraged, you know, they liked the ideas that I had for what should be done um, in terms of counseling one-on-one -on -one with women and how we need to engage obstetrical providers. Um, and so they said, great, wonderful ideas, and I left. I was on the way home from Nashville when I got a call um, from the director of Children's Care Coordination, and he said, how soon can you do this? Which to me was just astounding, because we write grants for years and years and years. We do everything we can in order to find money to fund our projects. And here someone had called me and said, what do you think we should do? And here's the money to do it. So that was one of those things where I one couldn't believe my incredible luck that this had happened. Um, and so I started thinking, okay, what are we going to do? He says, I said, well, how soon? He said, we want you to start by March 1st. Well, if you know anything about red tape and getting a grant project up and running, that was nearly impossible. So we did everything we could to push everything through the university. And amazingly, we were ready to go within the first couple of weeks of March. And so this is what um, Dr. Thompson mentioned, what became known as the Tennessee Intervention for Pregnant Smokers Program. So they funded us for four years. And essentially what we did was um, hired several uh, bachelor's level counselors to go in and counsel women about their smoking during pregnancy. We placed them in obstetric practices throughout the region. Um, we did a lot of training with providers, how to talk to pregnant women about smoking, how do we engage them, how do we give them the education, how do we give them the tools that they might need to quit smoking. Um, and so we, you know, got going, we ramped up, we had many bumps along the way, certainly. Um, but in the end, by the time we neared the end of our four years of funding, um, as Dr. Thompson said, we had provided services at this point to about 2,500 women. 2,500 pregnant smokers in the region um, that we had met with one-on-one -on -one to talk with them about their smoking. In addition to that, there were probably another five to 7,000 women who had had care from a provider that we'd trained. So someone who had become somewhat skilled in talking to pregnant women about smoking and helping them with this issue. So as we were nearing the end of our funding, we were a little discouraged because all of this was going to go away. And amazingly, once again, they got our near end of project report and said, we'd like to refund this. And so they said, what could, how long could you keep running with another $600,000?
like, oh, we could do at least two years. So we kept rolling. And by the end of the project, we had nearly 3,500 women that we had worked with. Um, and we had an amazing smoking cessation rate of 28%. So when you look at programs that are designed to help people quit smoking, a quit rate of 10%, 15% is huge. This is a highly addictive substance. Um, and we see that most intervention programs, people relapse, but in the end, maybe 10 to 15%. I was amazed. Every time I crunched our numbers and I looked at the data and found that we were nearing 30% of these women that we had managed to get them to quit smoking. So if you know anything about what the harmful effects of smoking are on a fetus and a developing child, you'll realize how huge this is. So we had a lot of children, um, upwards of 1,000 children, who ended up being born to a woman who had been smoking at the beginning of pregnancy and at the end was not smoking. And so the birth outcomes really started to improve across the region. You know, you'd, it, it was obviously watered down by a lot of other things, but we went in 2007 when we started the project, 32% of pregnant women in this region were smoking which is an astonishing number. Um, we were down when the project ended in 2013, right after we finished, the rate was about 23%. So that was region-wide in the eight counties in Northeast Tennessee. Um, along with that, we saw about a 20% reduction in preterm births and a 20% reduction in low birth weight births. So all of that obviously not a consequence of our direct work, there were a lot of other initiatives going on, but it certainly shows you if you can invest a significant amount of money in a, in a certain effort, make it focused, find something that works that's evidence-based, um, you really can move the numbers in a region on a lot of indicators. And so we were very, very fortunate that we were able to have the money. We had someone who saw the vision and um, the necessity of all of this. Um, and as you heard, for about a $2.2, $2.3 million investment, the state saved over $9 million in Medicaid costs for these babies. Um, so the, the, I guess the bottom line message out of that is if you can find somebody who's got the money up front, you can really do a lot in terms of prevention. It's just often hard in the current climate in healthcare to find that initial investment to make a difference. So um, we walked away from that in 2012 with a lot of community systems in place. So while we don't have funding for counselors anymore, we have providers in the region that are well aware of the efforts, that have a lot of training. We go and we train nursing students every semester still. And so they're getting into the region with these skills and this information, and we're hoping that the rates will continue to drop. Um, the other thing that came out of this project was I was able to leverage um, a lot of things. Um, it was a lot of money, and so there were a lot of things you could do with it. And I got very creative because at the heart, at my heart and my core, I'm a researcher. And so while the interventions were wonderful, I was really happy with what we were able to do. I really wanted some hard data to be able to show what are the long-term effects of the smoking in this region, how effective are our interventions, what are they doing for these children long-term. And so I was able to um, kind of move the money to make sure that we were doing our intervention, but also able to look at these children long term. And I convinced the state this was an important way to use the money because they're investing all this money. Don't you want to know how effective it is? Don't you want to know what these children look like six months later, a year and a half later? And so we were able to follow up with a lot of the children um, born to the women that were in our, our study. We were able to look at them out 18 months later and look at their developmental outcomes, their health and development. And so we found that the kids of the women who quit smoking compared to the women who continued to smoke, those kids were much better off. They were larger, they were healthier, had many fewer health problems. Um, developmentally, they were ahead in terms of language development, emotional development. And so we really were able to show that if you can get women to stop smoking during pregnancy, there's much better child outcomes, and this was the case in this region as well. Um, so, and in the end, when we finished up, I had all of this data that we're still madly rushing to kind of analyze and, and publish. It does take a while. Um, but it's been important to use that information to get additional funding. So within a year, I found 
uh, additional funding through the Appalachian Regional Commission, have gotten March of Dimes money to, in order to be able to continue some of these efforts at least on a small scale. So I've, I've been very encouraged by that. It's allowed me to network, um, you know, being known as the pregnancy smoking lady, at least you can walk into a health department, people know who you are and they're willing to listen. And so the state really pushed when we finished to um, make sure people were aware of the findings, make sure they were aware of the things that we had done. And so people know about them and people are interested in hearing what we found out and what we were able to do. And so health departments across the state now, I'm often getting calls, can you come and talk to our home health care workers? They are struggling with how they're going to talk to pregnant women about smoking and how they're going to address some of these issues. And so um, these are things that, um, you know, in a busy week, I get the call and I think, oh, I don't have time for this. But then I think, yes, I need to find the time because those are that's an important thing to do with the investment that the state made. And so um, I do a lot of traveling as, as a result, but that's okay. Um, so I think, you know, when all was said and done with that and as I move into other things that have kind of come out of that, I've been struck by a couple things. One, it, it's really good to be lucky and to be in the right place at the right time. Um, but it also really shows that when you work every day, even if you don't necessarily feel like you're being successful, so the first three years I was here, you know, none of those grants were getting funded. Everything I was doing was kind of small scale and I really felt like none of it was making a difference. That eventually something that you did or something that you published gets noticed by somebody and then they decide that this is a worthwhile investment. And it's kind of the same thing that we do every day when we're working with women, when we're working with children, that you never know what that one thing is that you're going to do that's going to make a difference in someone's life. And so even though on a day-to-day -day basis, it may not feel like you're being all that effective, when you can kind of reflect and look at it, back at it later, you realize you've, you've made a difference. Um, so that's kind of my professional story. Um, and it's interesting when I look now and I try to figure out kind of where to go from here with things, um, substance abuse has really been kind of at the core of, of what I've been interested in studying and what I've been interested in doing. And so now I'm directing an expert project, which is a screening and brief intervention in primary care related to substance use. And that to me has been very uh, rewarding because it's one of those things where you can see an immediate impact again. And so, you know, I went from 20 years ago being this peer researcher why do we need to translate and other people can do that to realizing that's really been the thing where I've been most rewarded in my career. And so, um, you know, I think if, if I can share anything with you, it's that evolution to find what it is that makes you satisfied professionally and being able to make a difference. So, um, you know, that's really what it was for me. So personal journey is a little bit harder, I guess. Um, some of that was, I guess, personal in a sense, but um, it's really hard when you kind of look at, at how you grow professionally and how you develop. Um, gets a little more complicated. So maybe I can just give you a little bit of a sense of that um, by recognizing some people that have had an impact in my life because um, you'll see as I, I mentioned a few people that um, really that was a personal journey as well. So um, you know everybody who has really helped me in my both personal and professional life and everyone I'll mention here has had has given me both practical and emotional support. So, you know, there are people in my life that I definitely couldn't do what I do without them. Um, but each of them has also contributed something beyond just that uh, practical and emotional support. So, the, first of all, and I'll um, mention this and, and tell you um, kind of how this came to be, but my parents and my children have been very, very important because the one thing they've done for me is that they've modeled passion and commitment. And this is something that I didn't really step back and think about until fairly recently. Um, I was the grand, invited to do the Grand Rounds talk at the OB department down at UT back a couple months ago. And I went in and gave kind of my usual spiel about pregnancy smoking and the dangers of pregnancy smoking and here's what you can do and here's interventions that work. And I had OBs that were sitting there and were very interested and I got all done and the residency program director came up to me and thanked me for being there and he said, I knew we had to have you. He says, I heard you talk back in May at a women's health conference in the region. And he said, I was just really struck by your passion and your commitment to what you do. And I, I, you know, I stepped back a minute and I thought about that and I thought, 
That's really the nicest thing somebody said to me in a long time because, you know, people often will tell you whenever you reach a certain point in your career, oh, you've done all of these things and they're very important. Um, but to hear that my passion and commitment had kind of come through and that's what someone had seen in what I do, um, that to me was really very heartening. And I thought, you know, I really have impacted people in a way that they listen because you can get up and you can give a talk about something but unless people know that it's something important to be passionate about and to be committed to often they walk away and go oh, okay well that was nice but don't necessarily turn that into action and so um, the one thing I have gotten from my family is this whole idea of this passion and commitment for what you do. So I'll give you an example of my parents who have made the trip from Michigan here, so I will point them out. Um, and my father is a good example because he um, had spent much of his life with a great passion for literature and for baseball. And so he turned that into a decades-long career as a high school English teacher and baseball coach. And I saw every day that passion and that commitment for what he does. And so even though he could have retired long ago, he continued working, he continued working um, many, many years behind his official retirement age, finally retired and then went and ran for the school board. And so now he's very actively involved in the school board. And so I see that level of passion and commitment. My mother is another good example. Um, she began her career as a kindergarten teacher and had a very strong passion for early child development and child learning and spent many years teaching. And then after I got into graduate school and was talking about all that I was doing in terms of child development, she decided to go back to school and get a graduate degree and so that she could teach and she could do community service work related to early child learning. And so I saw that at a point when a lot of people were kind of winding down and thinking about retirement, she took on a whole new career and went in a whole new direction. And so that to me was kind of powerful in terms of passion and commitment. Um, then I, I started thinking about my children, and some of this, I think, came from modeling from their grandparents, but hopefully I had some, something to do with it. Um, all three of my children have wonderful passion and commitment for what they do. Um, my youngest daughter, Caitlin, who is 12, um, decided at the age of five that she really wanted to do karate. She is tiny, to say the least, and so she was always the smallest one in the room, but she had this enormous energy to do karate, and so she was at karate multiple times a week. She was practicing. She was doing all of these things, and that was, she was so focused for a young child. I was just so amazed by that, and so she got her third degree black belt by the time she was 10 years old because she was so focused on the school. Um, and so, you know, I look and I think, wow, that is just amazing in terms of that level of commitment. My oldest daughter, Tori, who is also here, um, has had an enormous passion to become a nurse. And from the time she was four or five, she would tell you, I am going to be a NICU nurse when most kids that she would tell that to had no idea what a NICU nurse was, but she knew. And um, she had spent much of her life very sick and in and out of the hospital, missing months at a time of school. And probably where the fascination with nursing came from, I would guess, but um, she really had, um, because of this drive to get to this goal, she did not let any of this stop her. So she was doing homeschooling, she was doing all of these things, and ended up graduating in the top 10% of her class in high school, even though she missed probably the equivalent of, what, two, two years of high school um, with all the time that she was home. She's now a freshman in college and had early accepted into a nursing program and was almost not here today because she had a lot of schoolwork to do. And so <laughs> she was very committed. And I said, in the end, I said, okay, it's your choice. I'm not going to stand in the way of that. But, um, you know, very, very focused a load for a college freshman I certainly wouldn't want to have. And she has just been amazing with that commitment. Um, and then there's my oldest son who is not here this evening. He is a senior at the University of Michigan. And, well, I think maybe by credits he's only a junior, but you'll understand that in just a second. So he, um, he has been the one that has had an enormous passion for anything theater, anything singing, and he has always enjoyed that, but it's been a hobby. And so when he was looking at going to college, he was um, said I, he really enjoyed history, he was going to major in history, and he was going to be a high school history teacher. So we were thrilled, a family of teachers, great, he's going to be a history teacher. So he got into college, a little bumpy for him, but he was doing okay. 
um, about, I guess he was in his third semester of college, and I get a call from him, and he says, Mom, we need to talk. And so those are kind of scary phone calls because you never know quite what's coming. I said, okay, let's talk. Um, and so he said, you know, I'm really not sure this is the direction I want to go. And he had at that point taken a couple theater classes in college, and he said, I really think I want to change my major. I said, oh, okay, what are you changing your major to? He said, theater. I said, okay, good. <laughs> and so we were, my husband and I were talking, and we're like, wow, do you turn that into a career on a regular basis? How's that going to work? And so, you know, he said it, and I said, you know, if this is what you want to do, this is your life, you need to make that choice. And so he took off with it, ran with it. It meant he had a lot more classes to take, which explains why he's in his fifth, fourth year of college and not quite there yet. Um, but he has been, it has been amazing to see him to kind of blossom and follow this passion and he, I have never seen him happier, you know, he's just really focused on what he wants to do. Um, last year he was a finalist with the Kennedy Center uh, for Performing Arts, they give awards to college students in theater, he was a regional finalist for a production that he had been in and we just went up to see him gosh, less than two weeks ago, I feel like all I've been doing is traveling lately, um, went up to Michigan to see him in the University of Michigan's fall musical, and he had a role, and he was absolutely phenomenal. We, we left going, wow, maybe he really can make it in theater. And so um, at least he's happy, and he's doing something that he's passionate about. And so that to me, that to me was heartening. Even if, even if it doesn't turn out to be the most lucrative career for him, he's going to be happy. Um, okay, so that gives you a sense of the idea of passion and commitment. Um, next person I want to thank is my husband, Tim, who is also here today. And um, to give you a sense, I, he does an amazing job of keeping my life together and helping be there to take care of things for me. Um, but I think the thing that really most um, kind of embodies what he's done in terms of making my career possible is he's made it so that I have had very few impossibly difficult choices. And all of you who are working professionals are gonna know exactly what I mean here. Okay, when you are, especially when you're in a helping field of some kind, you very quickly end up overcommitted in your professional career. So there's so many things you see that you have to do, that you want to do. Yep, I can do that. Yes, I wanna help here. Yes, I wanna do that. And you get to the point where you can't possibly get it all done in a day. Throw into that having kids. And I think Karen can probably agree with me here that pediatricians and uh, developmental psychologists put a lot of pressure on themselves to be perfect parents. And so you really end up in this situation of push and pull where there's so many things at work, you've got your kids that have things at home, and how do you make it all happen? And then the worst thing happens that there's three things happening all at the same time. And how do you get there? And so what Tim manages to do is he finds a way for me to get to all the things or makes a certain that I can get things done and the kids feel supported, which is the main thing. So to give you an example here, and this is a professional, professional conflict, but just me being here tonight was a result of him making it happen. So when I found out about the date for this, I realized it overlapped with the American Public Health Association annual conference at which I was speaking. And so I got the schedule and I thought, okay, I think I can make this work. And then I looked and I realized I was speaking yesterday in New Orleans. And I was speaking in the morning and I was speaking later in the day. And so I started looking at the flight schedules. There was no way for me to finish speaking in New Orleans, get to the airport, get on a plane, and get back to Tri-Cities last night. So I thought, well, I can try to fly home in the morning, but that made me a little nervous in terms of making sure I was back here. So he says, no problem, I'll go with you, I'll drive. And so I finished speaking at, what, 4.30, 5 o'clock yesterday afternoon, and he drove through the night in order to get me here and said, well, this is just what we have to do. And so that has been enormous, and I thank you very much for, for all of those kind of things. All right, and then I have a lot of colleagues, past and present, who have really helped drive um, who I am and what I do. And I think the key for any of my mentors has been this sense of professionalism and really um, kind of helping me develop who I am, not only professionally, but as a person. When I was at Wayne State University, I had incredible mentors. And I didn't, unfortunately, realize it at the time. It wasn't until I left that I realized what wonderful people they were. Um, I certainly respected what they did and felt that they taught me a lot. But they were 
uh, incredible in terms of their professional commitment. And so I'm often, when I get in a difficult situation or when I have something where I don't know what to do, the first thing that goes through my mind is what would one of those people do? And that usually helps me solve the problem. And one of these was my dean. He was the dean of the College of Medicine, but he was also a fetal alcohol researcher. And so we worked together quite a bit. And immediately when I run into this, and he was one of these people going in a million different directions and always had an answer, always had a solution. And sometimes I would pick up the phone and call him and say, I'm really stuck, help. Uh, but more often than not, I would think, what would he do? And I could usually think through, I know exactly what he would do here, and this is the thing I should probably do. And so those people in my career have really guided a lot of the decisions that I have made. Um, here at ETSU, I have been blessed to be surrounded by wonderful professionals, both faculty and staff. Uh, there are two in particular from outside my department that I absolutely have to recognize here. Um, one of them is Dr. Andy Clements from Psychology, and the other is Dr. Judy McCook, who is back in the back of the room there. Um, and they have been enormous in terms of their level of commitment to the things that I find important as well. And so we work very well together. They have pushed me to succeed. They have pushed me to publish. They have pushed me when I really thought, there's no way we can do this. And then Judy says, yes, we can, and here's how. And so she comes up with wonderful ideas all the time, and that has really been enormous to me in terms of encouraging me. Um, other group of people that have been incredible in terms of working with me and making me feel good about what I do every day is the staff in the department and the staff that have worked with me on grant funded projects. Um, there have been a lot of people, um, two of them are sitting back there, Lana McGrady and Alicia Williams. Um, Lana has been with me for a long time. Uh, she has been project manager for a couple projects I have done and has really been um, the person who makes it all happen. I could not in every day possibly get done everything I do and um, she has really helped to make my life easier and helped to make uh, what I do uh, really sing for other people. Uh, and it's interesting, a lot of people will say, you know, I tried to call you and Lana won't let me near you because she says you're busy. <laughs> and she guards me very carefully to make sure I can get done what I need to in a day. So I'm very grateful for that and, and for all the people who've worked on projects. Alicia works on our Esper project and we had some amazing people on the TIPS project who just, who were so good with the women. You know, I can direct and I can come up with an idea, but if there aren't good people to actually carry it out in practice, it doesn't happen and it's not successful. And so those people have been very instrumental. And then finally, the faculty in family medicine, I cannot say enough good things about the people that I work with every day. They are amazing professionals. Their commitment and their passion is very evident every day. Um, my chair is here, Dr. John Franco, and he has been amazingly supportive. He came to us. I had been here four years when he came in as chair of the department, and um, I was in one of the groups that interviewed him when, when he came. And, you know, he sat down and he was talking about what he was going to do for the clinics and all of these things. And I kept thinking, but what about research? What about research? And um, he talked a little bit about it, but I realized when he got here that his support was more of a, that's your area of expertise, you go do it, and made sure that everybody in research had the support that they needed in order to be successful. So we've been very appreciative of that. Um, and then the other faculty in my department are um, just wonderful professionals in terms of their commitment. Um, I, every day it's a joy to go to work, to work with a lot of these people who are just very enthusiastic about what they do and they make it very possible for me to pursue my passion every single day of improving lives of women and children. So thank you very much for this honor and congratulations to Karen as well.